Good afternoon and welcome to the Carolina Codecast, the official podcast of the Carolina Code Conference. With me today is Luke Kapuska. Say hello, Luke. Hey, Barry. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for being here. So, so what are you up to these days? Introduce yourself. It's interesting what I'm up to these days because these days it's just about anything. I'm a penetration tester by trade. What I do is test security systems, uh, internal, external networks, uh, buildings, social engineering people, and especially web applications that might be the most uh, pertinent for your um, audience. What's really nice about my job is in January and February, things tend to scale back a little bit. Things slow down. December is our busiest month because it seems like clients want work done yesterday in December. So I'm, I'm enjoying the downtime and the, the slower times, but I'm certainly staying busy with with learning, with education, with other training. Uh, it's, a, it's a never stop learning type of, uh, type of a field. That's, that's definitely the best kind. So, I mean, if, if December ramps up, I would imagine that uh, a lot of companies have uh, security certifications that probably require an annual penetration test. And so is there just exactly. like the blur of people going, oh, we haven't done the test this year. Hurry up and get it done. Exactly. Yet we warned them beginning around spring to summer or so. We warned them, hey, we're going to get really busy in uh, November and December. Let's go ahead and get you scheduled up. And Mr. and Mrs. Client says, oh, we're still working on this and that. We're going to have to wait a little bit longer before we can schedule. It goes that way every single year. Yep. It's uh, it's funny how stuff like that goes. So, um, so, so you're a penetration tester. Talk about what, what does a penetration tester do exactly? I'm testing networks, web applications, buildings, and people. Uh, let's let's talk about what's more important for what I think your audience is interested in, and that's web applications. Okay. Now, web applications have multitudes of vulnerabilities, some that can be tested by automated scanners and some that need an actual human being. We're not quite at the artificial intelligence level yet. It's, it's just not good enough to the point of running an, a web application through some kind of a machine and expecting the machine to actually find those vulnerabilities. So it takes a human touch to think through things, to, to methodically run through the application, to find, um, find vulnerabilities that couldn't be found in an automated fashion, even though the automated testers are helping us greatly during this uh, type of work. Nice. Nice. And so do you recommend, you know, for your clients to, to run automated scanners ahead of time just so that that's that's one less thing that you need to worry about or is it something that you're going to do regardless anyway and might find some stuff that they didn't i'm going to do it anyway but that's actually a great thought i've never had a conversation with a client who has run an automated scanner and let's say for um, web application testing the the type of automated tool that we're using is an interception proxy the most popular that maybe your your audience might be familiar with is burp suite pro and that essentially captures the traffic outbound to the server and then coming back from the server to the to the uh, web browser through its own interface. In that interface, I can manipulate requests. I can view the requests, search for uh, hidden information in comments, and run various fuzzing and, and other um, vulnerability type of checks using that tool. Interesting. Okay, so I've heard of Burke Suite. I haven't gotten really hands-on with it before, but I've... Uh, I know I've heard you and I believe Tim Tomes has, has kind of talked about Burp Suite a lot. It, um, it's, it's basically the primary tool uh, for all these days. It's the best in class right now. Right. So, so tell me a little bit about what, what Burp Suite does. You know, you've kind of, you know, how would you use that if you were testing a web application that, that I wrote, for example? Let's say if I were testing a web application that you wrote, I would not find any issues and I would hand you a report that's completely empty because I'm sure it's highly secure and everything is checked out. Let's that say is the correct answer. So how about younger me? If you, were, if you were testing an application that younger me wrote that is full of vulnerabilities because I did not know any better. Or let's say the average developer who may not be completely <laughs> versed in, in security protocol and writing these applications. There's so many things that, that. that it's capable of. It's a very large, dense tool. If you can, um, if you can compare it to Adobe Photoshop, for example, 
Photoshop has just an immense tool set that's capable of so much. Burp Suite is very much the same way. In fact, when I started using it, I was quite intimidated about learning all of its intricacies and all of the features so that I could use it to the, to the best of my ability. But let's say, for example, um, I had a client call this morning, and I won't go into details of who the client is, but um, we were discussing how I was able to trigger a, an error through the API that wasn't visible in the web application. This error was triggered through an SQL injection prompt. However, I wasn't able to execute the full SQL injection. SQL injection, for those who may not be aware, is a way to essentially take over or you could say interact with the SQL database in an unintended fashion, something that most developers wouldn't have thought of doing. And I essentially would be able to uh, grab the API request. It's a post request, so you can't send it with a web browser and change some of the text in it inside that, um, that post body and then send it on to the server. The server would then respond with an error message. The client was very confused as to how I did this because they said they couldn't um, uh, reproduce it in a web browser, which is quite natural because the web browser is only making GET requests from the address bar, not POST requests, which Burp allows me to do. So that's one example of how Burp lets us to do something, in this case, um, something that, that was completely unrelated to the web browser that would not have been visible to the user. The, the API request nor the response to that API request was, was visible to the user. It's completely hidden behind the interface. And this tool helped me find it and present that to the client. Very nice, very nice. So is Burp Suite something that as a developer, I should be finding a way to integrate into my development process, my, my CI pipeline, or is it more specifically a tool directly for use with uh, as a penetration tester only? I don't want to gatekeep and, and dictate who should use the tool. Since it's very dense, it would take a developer some time to learn it. I would say weeks or even months to really learn it all. However, someone can jump in and run an automated scan or, or see those, um, these, those requests coming and going from the server to the web browser and get a sense for what's happening on the back end. I think one of the most important things that, that Burp Suite allows one to see is that these requests can be manipulated. And one of the, the general rules in security for a web developer is never trust user input. And if I can manipulate something using that tool, that is user input, whether I'm inputting it through a web browser or let's say the web browser has a, uh, an input field that has some kind of a client side control through JavaScript or, or whatever, that doesn't allow me to inject special text such as um, the, the greater than or less than equal signs uh, single apostrophe, et cetera. If I can inject that in Burp Suite, I've proven that yes, the client side controls work, but Burp Suite allows me to inject other data, which still shouldn't be um, trusted by the server. Uh, so to answer your question and, and kind of circle back to that is yeah. I would say, yes, a developer should get some hands on. There's a community version and a pro version. The community version has very similar features, not quite the, the high speed fuzzing that the pro version has, and it doesn't have the automated scanner. But if you're in a large development house and you have multitudes of web applications or one really big one, it's $400 a year. It's probably money well spent to, to buy the pro version, get to use it, at least run the automated scanner to get a sense of, of what it's doing, what's there. And, um, for the manual type of work, have have a user run through all the features, all the functions of a web application, and watch what that looks like in Burp Suite. Because while that while Burp Suite is capturing that data, it's also going to find other vulnerabilities that the automated scan may not have simply by manually interacting with the web application. It's pretty good value. I need to see if I can go get Burp Suite to to uh, sponsor this podcast. <laughs> I think you probably convinced a lot of people. I know I want to go check it out now. So one learn. of the other things that you mentioned, though, and, and I completely agree with you, by the way, on not, not trusting user input. That's That was one of the hardest lessons, you know, just as somebody who spent all of, the, all of my time in back-end development coming up through the early 2000s where everything was only back-end, and then it moved so heavily to the front-end, uh, and you had a lot of developers who were so heavily on the front-end making those API calls that, uh, a lot of times, some of the back end 
security was getting overlooked because people were more focused on the interface. And it seems like it, it balanced out after a while and, and everybody, everybody kind of got the various toolkits and security kits and frameworks that were out there that were needed to, um, to, to help safeguard things a little bit better by default. It's but, getting better. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it always used to drive me nuts when I'd want to perform some type of validation on the front end for a, for a user because it, it improved the experience of the application. But then I had to go and write that exact code again on the back end because I couldn't trust the user input <laughs> and I might be having to write it in a different language. Um, but uh, so one of the other things that you mentioned is kind of segueing a, a little bit. You mentioned you also test people and social engineering. So talk about that a little bit because because I, I personally, I, I know I've told you this, like I've got a, I've got a fascination with the cybersecurity world uh, and a lot of it is because I got hooked on a podcast called Darknet Diaries uh, a couple of years back, and I binge listened to it. And it's got all these interesting stories. But social engineering is absolutely fascinating to me because no matter what you do from a technical standpoint to safeguard an application, people can still be compromised, and they are compromised. So talk to me about that. Like, What do you do with that? What has been your experience with that? And how did you get into that side of things? Like, how do you train the social engineer people? Darknet Diaries is an excellent podcast. Uh, the way Jack Recyder, the host, tells stories is incredible. His his methodology and just the way that he can speak through things is better than me, it, that I could tell stories for, for sure. Uh, so it's it's highly entertaining and enjoyable. And he can deliver that to multitudes of audiences. If you're a young teenager, he'll he'll warn whether the, the material might be sensitive or, yeah. or questionable, which is great. And whether you're a, a seasoned professional, either developer security or, or any way interested in technology or the world, one of his stories probably can can ring true to, to your own outlook on life. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't quite remember exactly how I got into social engineering. I think I just picked it up in my team and back up a little bit. I work in a team. We have about 50 members or so. It includes um, uh, project managers, uh, senior managers, and most of us are penetration testers. The multitude of us test exactly what I do, the the whole gamut of, of things. There's a couple of red team uh, operators, you could say, and their their focus is a little bit different than penetration testing. If you want to get into that, we'll get into that, but I want to focus on your question first. Uh, our team has about 50, so we, we generally don't specialize in one thing, but I found myself focusing more and more on social engineering, particularly in, in the sense of physical assessments as well. Uh, social engineering interests me very well because I have a a strong moral boundary not to lie to people. Unfortunately, we have to lie to people. So I try to do it as lighthearted as possible. And when my interaction finishes with them, I want to drop as much praise as I possibly can on, on the individual and tell them, here's exactly what I'm doing. Here's why I had to lie. And I apologize for lying. And here's what you did really well. I had this great conversation with someone uh, when I did an on-site assessment at a manufacturer in Ohio. This was a security guard, and I stood in front of her for 45 minutes trying to get past some security gates, and she would not budge. She she did everything by the book exactly as, as I would have described the right way to do things, and she held firm, and she didn't let me pressure her. She didn't let me um, cause her to trip up, to make mistakes, even though I tried. I tried from multiple different angles to to put a time pressure on her, to put some guilt on her because I was going to be in big trouble for my manager if I didn't get in there um, really quick and I just had to go and my time was super valuable and, and all sorts of reasons why she should allow me through this security gate and she didn't budge. And the, there are stories like that where I'm, I interact with folks uh, on an engagement like that and they, they do it well. Other times it's not so, not so great for the, um, for the client or for the employee that I interact with, sometimes they simply let it let us go. I can think of so many um, so many examples where when I used to work in a corporate office a couple of years ago, where I saw people holding doors open for others all the time, and you had no idea whether the person that was walking through that open door was an employee or whether they were up to no good. 
uh, whether yeah. they had a grudge or whether they were going to physically attack someone. So there's there's many it's just a um, culture things. Many, it's polite, right? It, it is polite, but there are polite ways of handling that as well. In in a personal sense, one can easily ask, "Hey, I would really like to hold this door open for you, even though I see that you're pregnant, even though I see that you're carrying sixty pounds of boxes. I still have to ask for your ID, and then I'll be happy to to hold this door open for you." And those two things that I mentioned, I was on site at a different um, engagement where my director joined me and she mentioned that story. If if you look like you're pregnant or if you put on the, the pregnancy suit, if you're female and you look like you're carrying something heavy, everyone will hold the door open for you. Unfortunately, it doesn't apply to me since I can't use that sort of a ruse. But there are others carrying carrying heavy looking um, equipment or boxes can, can certainly help. So I think yeah. it's... It's an heard of fake cast as well. Absolutely. Like, like you've got a broken arm or an arm in a sling or something like that. Yeah. If you see somebody who looks like they're struggling and you don't know them, if you see somebody with a clipboard that says official on the back, it's probably not. If you see somebody carrying a ladder, it might be an employer or it might not be. And if you see someone in a, um, a yellow safety vest, then they might be using that as a costume, so to say, yeah. to try to get into a space. These are typical things that we'll use to um to bypass security controls and what you mentioned is probably the vulnerability of humans how we're very trusting with others we're we're wired to be trusting and i i hate to say that we have to be skeptical with everything that we do and everyone that we interact with but i think a little skepticism goes a long way that sometimes what we see or what we're experiencing in the world is not exactly what it looks like it is yeah absolutely yeah so now I've heard um, one other piece of, of the social engineering picture isn't just you know using social engineering to get inside of a building, uh, but also using it on like the phone lines when you call in. Uh, is that something that you've done? I have done the phone, and I mostly do email social engineering, sending oh, wow. phishing messages. So once the um, let me talk about the email first because it's the yeah, more common one. I would say the the next most common one is physical and the least common would be um, voice phone calls. But the emails are pretty straightforward. We build a server, we build a landing page that looks identical to a, a corporate page or Dropbox, PayPal, Gmail, whatever login. It, it's going to look identical. It's going to look really good because most of our clients don't want it to look kind of trashy. They don't want it to look amateurish. They want it to look um, very... Um, with very low suspicion right? and um, we'll send an email stating that there's a problem with your account, that there's something to worry about. Rarely will we say that someone has won something that that leads into a, a weird psychological state where someone is expecting something and it, they didn't get it. it. We find that it's safer psychologically to, to discuss things that may lead to loss. You might lose, lose your job. You might lose some vacation. You might, um, have your vacation interrupted because our corporate calendar is changing. You might lose something and that tends to get some clicks rather than, Hey, you've won a million dollars because unfortunately many threat actors out there have already used that, that ploy of, of winning of, Hey, I'm a prince from Nigeria and I have billions of dollars to share with you. Just send me $500 for the processing fee, things like yeah. that. It's, it's been going on for so many years. Skeptical. <laughs> What's that? So when, uh, winning anything, being told I want anything would immediately make me skeptical. It, and it should, because rarely do we actually win anything unless you're scratching off your own ticket in, in a gas station and you want a lottery yeah. or something. Um, so, so you're very right about that. Um, I did talk about the physicals. The phone vishing, as we call it, voice phishing, is to me one of the more challenging ones because I don't see the person. I can't read their body language. I can't read their facial cues. So I don't have any feedback as to how they're responding to me and and my my game, you could say. I haven't done a voice phishing in a long time. I think it was four or five years ago. I think oh. my team has done one or two since then. So our, our voice, voice phishing uh, work is very light, but I would say the, the email phishing is the most common and um, and generally used by most organizations to test their their employees. All right, nice. So on um, now, I don't know if you know this or not, but I've I've spent a lot of time in the anti phishing world. I didn't uh, know that. And so it's for a lot of the last ten years, I've been doing anti phishing work and uh, and DMARC work, um, because I had to you know I spent an entire year basically combating fraud and phishing 
uh, at a company that I was at about a decade ago. And it got me really interested in it. But uh, so when you set up like a, a, a server and a, and a fake phishing page to, um, to get somebody engaged, do you have to, do you coordinate with the IT department to whitelist your messages to look like they're coming from uh, internally? Or do you just, do you go ahead and send them and, and first tell them, hey, look, you don't have DMARC set up. So these are all going to get through anyway. Um, like how exactly does that work uh, for you all on that side? It really depends on what the client is looking for. Nine times out of 10, I will ask the client to whitelist our domain, whitelist the, the serving IP, and whitelist the inbound domain on their mail server. The reason why is typically we're hired to perform a phishing engagement. We're not hired to try to bust through the, the IT and the security controls. However, we'll still perform all the due diligence that, that is necessary to run that campaign with quality. We'll, we'll of course get an S H HTTPS um, uh, a certificate, an SSL certificate. So, so it's all encrypted because in many cases, our landing page is going to collect a username and password. And we, we most certainly need to, um, to secure that data in flight and also disk encryption uh, while it's in storage. We'll ask okay. the, um, the IT group to, to test a couple of times to ensure that our emails are coming in. We'll check the DMARC. We'll ensure that SPM is um, configured appropriately uh, and the DKIM as well. I think SPM, I forget all of the, the acronyms. But like your Stellar articles suggested, these are the things that, that makes email legitimate. And we're going to do those legitimate steps. Uh, one of the things you didn't ask, and I wanted to add to this, is the email service that we use. I've started moving away from it, but the one that I've used most recently, well, not the most recently, generally recently, is um, using Microsoft's own services. Now, Microsoft probably doesn't like us using their email services to to transit our emails through because they don't want to, to support malicious activity. Technically, our activity is quasi-malicious. We're doing it under a contract for valid reasons um, in a legal manner. But also an attacker could do the very same thing that we're doing in exactly the same way. So some, some service providers don't like it for that reason. However, mm -hmm. most inbound servers, email servers, trust Microsoft by default. So that's an easy way to, to get yeah. in. Uh, sometimes the whitelisting doesn't work out as well as we hope. And sometimes um, the, the, the SPN and DKIM, uh, those, those controls need to be set perfectly because those, um, those servers do not like any, any hint of, um, of impropriety, even if the administrators have set all the whitelists and, and allowed everything from our domain and our IP. Absolutely. I'll tell you what, we're going to take a quick break for a minute. And uh, then when we come back, we'll, we'll continue talking about, uh, about fishing here with Luke. Revolutionize your skills with Seek Quality, your certified GitLab training partner. Unleash the power of CICD with the latest training materials from GitLab. A variety of courses led by GitLab certified professional services engineers go beyond the basics. With over 20 years of experience, Seed Quality's full stack developers and DevOps engineers not only guide you through the material, but also help you understand how it impacts your work. Transform your expertise at SeedQuality.net, where GitLab training meets real world innovation. All right, welcome back from the break. We're, we're here with Luke. And so we're going to continue talking. About, and, you know, as we went to the break, we were talking about uh, some of the anti phishing stuff that, um, that we've seen in the past and you were talking about using uh, Microsoft's tools like Office 365 and whatnot to send email uh, and, and get past some of the, the various whitelisting that's already in there or because their servers are typically whitelisted. And uh, I was actually going to give you a suggestion on a way that you might want to approach this engagement at some point in the future is um, don't ask to be whitelisted. Ask for a valid DKIM key because you can simulate this process. If you have valid DKIM, you'll pass DMARC. You don't have to pass SPF and, D, uh, and DKIM. You just have to pass one of them. And so what you can do is you can simulate that somebody got access to your DKIM private key. And so, nice. because people can do that. 
because you have to rotate those keys. That's actually part of good security practice, just like you have to rotate an SSL certificate uh, because it will expire eventually. And so um, and a lot of people don't do that. And so you can simulate, you know, an old key was out there for a long time. It got compromised or somebody in your IT department left and took the key with them and sold it online or something like that. So they can pretend to be you. But you can use that as a way to simulate it without actually having, having to be whitelisted. That's a great point. And I'm glad you have some awareness on this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm big, big fan. I I had to deal with so many fish for for a solid year back when I was at the two-way marketplace and just people were constantly trying to defraud me. It was kind of like a, like a eBay for, an, for a very niche market. And, um, but people were just constantly trying to defraud people. It was, it was crazy. But, um, so, uh, on the, you know, we were just talking about social engineering and fishing and anti fishing. Do you ever get any pushback from like the IT departments about whitelisting stuff? Cause I know the very first time that I was, a per- whenever I first engaged with a, uh, with a pen testing company to come in and do like the security awareness training and everything and do, uh, and they, they wanted to simulate phishing in attacks. And the very first thing they did was they asked us to whitelist. And I said, but I don't want a whitelist. I want to simulate what a real attack looks like. And if you can't get through my defenses, I don't want that to go through. <laughs> I, mean, I, don't want to, I don't want to train my people to be used to seeing stuff that should never come through. That's why, that's why I mentioned the DKIM thing, because it gives you an opportunity to, to simulate what a real attack could look like without actually having to be whitelisted. And you can see all the various systems respond. Again, this depends on the the client and what they want, but we ask for that whitelist so that we're not fighting the the IT security and we are directing our efforts at the people that the organization is trying to protect. And that's that usually sense. the employees, the, the consultants, and sometimes their their own clients that are using yeah. the email. Um, I've actually heard this described as a, you know, if you want us to simulate breaking into the building and spend a month scouting the building to figure out how to get in and the best way to penetrate your fences and dig a tunnel if we need to. We can do that, but you have to pay for that time. And it's just a matter of how much of your time you want us to invest in this or if you want to speed the process along. And that's and, exactly uh, the, the conversation we have. If you want us to to try to penetrate those defenses, it's going to take more time. It's going to cost you more. Do you want us to test those or do you want us to test your people? Sometimes yep. the answer, I'd say nine times out of 10, we're asked to test the people. One time out of 10, we're asked to test those defenses. And then if we can break through that, test a certain number of individuals inside the company. Nice. And that makes perfect sense. Uh, I didn't, I did not get that the very first time that I engaged on one of these. So I just kind of wanted to, to spread that around a little bit. Um, so uh, any, any interesting stories that you can share from, from any past experiences with, uh, with pen testing or, or social engineering or that you want to share? There are so many. I can't think of one that's incredibly useful. Uh, I, I really enjoy the physical pen testing. I enjoy being on site, looking at a building from an attacker's perspective, talking to individuals, reading their body language, understanding their cues, finding different ways in. It's, it's a very similar mindset to all of the other work that we do. We're looking for the same things on external web applications, We're looking for the same things on internal networks, external networks. It's simply a, a different environment, if it's a physical environment or a virtual environment. I can tell a story where, um, where my, my peer and I, but both of us, there's about three of us in the, the team that does most of the physical tests. And um, this other gentleman and I were asked, this was a slightly different engagement than most others. We were simply asked to find one path and attempt one goal. That goal was to plant malware on an employee's um, laptop or, or workstation. And we were somewhat able to accomplish that, maybe about 90% of it, 80% of that. Uh, the client didn't want us to look for all the vulnerabilities, which um, in in this In this field, you might hear the two terms penetration testing and red teaming being used interchangeably, but they're slightly different. A penetration tester looks for all the vulnerabilities. A red teamer looks for one path to one goal. Sometimes they might find two or three paths, but they're they're essentially going for one goal. So our, our task was a red team engagement, which we started and other peers in our team continued on. And our path was to enter a building. We entered through the ground floor through a um, through 
a turnstile gate. There was no way we're going to hop over the gate. There was no way we're going to push the gate open because they were alarmed. So we had to talk our way through it. Luckily, there was a WeWork in this building. And we were able to simply say, hey, we're going up to the WeWork and we're going to work. He and I, we are going to go work at the WeWork. <laughs> and <laughs> and that worked twice. That, that worked for two days. Uh, both days, the, the guards... The guards are a third party um, organization, so they didn't work for our client. They didn't work for WeWork, they were hired by someone else. So that could be another issue that we brought up with the client. And they they were very lax about letting us through, even though we had purchased, we had each purchased a, um, a day pass to the WeWork space. And I had screenshotted the first day pass and modified the date to show on the second day, which they didn't even ask us about. So technically we paid once to get into WeWork and we may have been the cause of the bankruptcy of WeWork just recently because we didn't pay for that second day when we entered into their space. <laughs> I know nothing about that. Technically we just walked through their space. We didn't sit down and use it. Uh, so I don't feel too guilty about that. But yeah. essentially we've I heard that a was fairly ways. common issue. Uh, what's that? I actually heard in, in some other article that was a fairly common WeWork issue. That people would just sneak in? Yeah. I can't imagine. <laughs> I can't imagine they would do that. <laughs> but um, the the security guards were fairly lax, even though the physical security was was pretty great. There, there's no way that we're going to bypass those turnstiles other than hopping over them with with a backpack full of tools and possibly setting off alarms. Yet, talking nicely to the security guards, explaining our issue and explaining what we're there to do, sounding legitimate was perfectly enough to get past that. Uh, when we left, we had a good chat with the client in front of the security guards and how some of those things could be improved. I, I didn't follow up with them to see just how how they're going to improve that conversation with that security group to to figure out if there's a better way to vet individuals coming into that building because a lot of these high-rise buildings are shared spaces. There's yeah. multiple clients in a building, and in this case, a WeWork is... Uh, a, a very broad mix of people. There were some people working for the day. There were some people on the same floor that had permanent offices or semi-permanent offices. I saw big recording studios set up. I wouldn't say big, smaller recording studios set up in some offices. There were some um, legal counsel, maybe some consultants that were working out of there, as well as general everyday IT professionals just popping into the WeWork for a coffee or whatever. Um, so it, it increased the risk because of the, the numbers and the diversity of people uh, coming in and out of that space. That one was probably the most um, recent interesting one. I had. Interesting. So you you mentioned red team. And so in a minute, I'm going to ask you about, about blue teams. Um, but uh, before we get into that, I'm going to segue off to, to one of the organizations that you're involved with here. Uh, you're very involved with a group a meetup group called DC 864. Um, I don't want to limit it to just a meetup group because I know y'all have a, an entire discord forum and, and everything as well. And y'all end up doing a lot of events in the area too. So tell me a little bit about DC 864. What does it, you know, what does it stand for? What do y'all do? I'd be happy to, but first a little background about what DC is and where it started. Okay. There's a conference in Las Vegas every August because August seems to be the best time to go visit Las Vegas. <laughs> so, so every yeah. August when it's 120 awesome. degrees outside, there's an organization called DEF CON that, well, I, actually, I don't remember the name of the organization, but it's one organization that runs two conferences in August because if you're going to go to one conference in August in Vegas, you might as well go to two during the same week and a half span. Um, one Makes is called sense. Black Hat. The other one is called DEF CON. Black Hat is more business oriented. DEF CON is more attacker, adversary, defense oriented, more hands on, mm -hmm. more technical, whereas the Black Hat is more business, um, as I mentioned. So DEF CON a couple of years ago decided to expand their, their reach a bit by allowing local groups like you and I, who are interested in security, to start up our own chapter. So DC stands for DEF CON, 864 is our local area code, and we cleverly put that together into DC 864. Genius. It's, it's genius. miraculous. So two individuals started the group, and 
I think that was in 2017, 2018 ish. I, I found the group and joined them maybe three to six months after they started because I wasn't, the, the outreach wasn't quite as um, lively as we have right now, not quite as active. But um, we have a fairly large group. We have a very active Discord. We have monthly meetings. Uh, we also have monthly lunch meetings occasionally. Uh, sometimes, nice. uh, sometimes those meetings are the, the afternoon meetings when we meet at libraries. Typically, uh, those are more hands-on and technical. The lunch is are are very open-ended. Sometimes we'll have an evening social after the meeting just to um, to unwind a little bit and loosen up. Uh, it's a great group of folks, and and the diversity is what's really great. We have folks who are trying to get into the field, sometimes students. Uh, we have several developers that have been coming regularly, and we have several security professionals. Nice. Uh, I don't want to discount other groups as well. I do have to make a plug for another related group. They're called ISSA. I don't recall the um, the the acronym. I know information security is somewhere in there, but they're they're originally more business oriented and the ISSA group for Greenville has been around a little bit longer. The, um, the thing that I've argued is the outreach isn't quite as strong as the DC group and, and the ISSA is a little more closed off. But, um, if any of your, your viewers or listeners want to get involved in that, I can certainly help connect to the right place. Or if they want to join the, the DEF CON discord from DC 864.org, we have plenty of conversation and we post updates when the ISSA group is joining, uh, when they're meeting. It's usually once a month on a Friday for lunch. Nice. So, so we're not the only active security group in the area. And, and I certainly want to, um, to give respect to all the others as well. And there's also, um, I think there's also an InfraGuard group as well. But, uh, the, the InfraGuard group, I'm part of it, but it's not very active in the Greenville area. I think. I think there is an annual meeting, but they're fairly quiet for the upstate uh, yeah. throughout the year. There, there's sometimes a, a semi-annual, maybe a quarterly meeting in Columbia or or near Charleston, but it's not it's not quite an active group. There's also um, other offshoots of groups. There have been 2,600 groups over the past couple of years. I think the closest one might be Atlanta. There's a group in Charlotte. They don't follow the DC nomenclature, uh, they they are a legitimate security group in Charlotte. There's one in Columbia. Unfortunately, they use Slack and we use Discord, and you know we just can't can't make that work. Yeah, yeah. That's well. You, I know for a fact that you live in both Slack and Discord worlds because you know, you've got the DC eight six four Discord, and you're also in the uh, pretty active in the Hack Greenville Slack as well. That's that's actually where I found out about DC eight six four from in the first place, and so. With with the structure of DC eight six four, I mean, whenever y'all have these meetups, uh, you know, I've I've gotten to come out to a couple of them. I got y'all invited me out to um, to announce the Carolina Code Conference. You were know, actually the first group that I got to talk about the Code Conference at, and uh, and back in November, I think it was, I believe it was November, uh, I got to come out and give y'all kind of a, a talk about security tools on the on the CI pipelines that are in uh, that are in GitLab, and had a lot of fun. I had to leave right after the talk. And I hated that because I know there's a bunch of other, of other stuff. We had a dinner reservation that I couldn't, that I couldn't miss with another couple. <laughs> so sorry about that, but thanks for having me out for it. But after you have your speaker, you have a lot of other stuff going on. You have these villages uh, where people will, will break out and they'll, there's a lock picking village, a red team village and a blue team village. Um, so tell me about those a little bit. Cause I'm, I'm interested in hearing more about these. So we'll start Certainly. with the lock picking village. Certainly to give you an idea of what a typical meeting looks like, we usually have an agenda where there's a speaker and then these, these breakout sessions or breakout meetings. The, the main core talk is typically 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes, which I'm not to run them too long because it's more difficult to hold someone's attention for more than 45 minutes. And it's also yeah. more difficult to come up with something to talk about for 45 minutes. Some of us can fill that time. Others cannot. One thing I brought up, and I hope to see that this year, are micro talks, maybe talks that are 10 to, to maybe 10 to 15 minutes each and have three of those a night and then run the breakout sessions. The, yeah, I've, the I've typically heard, the, heard those called lightning talks. Sure. Uh, whatever you call it, they're, they're shorter talks that are more, um, uh, more suitable for individuals who aren't 
either interested in talking for a very long period of time or those who aren't as experienced in speaking or who don't want to put together a, a giant presentation with PowerPoint. Uh, my first talk was at B-Sides Greenville. It was on cybercrime. It took me about three months to prepare for that talk. And mm -hmm. I think I overprepared to the point where I could talk through that thing backwards and forwards, forwards and back, but I couldn't make it shorter than about 50, 55 minutes or so because I had so much, so much to, to cover. But that, that gives you an idea. Maybe, maybe I'm a noob at talking. I can't just jump on stage and start yapping away, but um, it, it takes some, some individuals like myself some time to, to put it together and, and make it cohesive and make it Absolutely. run really well and be able to, to handle adversity, dropping notes or technical issues or whatever. So yeah, the, the DEFCON practice definitely helps. I mean, people should always be getting out to these various meetups and talking whenever they get the chance to, even if it's for a shorter talk, just because the experience is good for you. It, help, uh, it, it helps you learn to do it more later on in life. And, you know, it, It'll serve you well. That's, that's one of the things that we really try to push for at the conference. We want to introduce newer speakers uh, that we want to definitely reserve some blocks for pe people who have not given a lot of talks just because you know, there's no better time than the present. Um, but one thing that's actually really good about lightning talks, too, in my experience, is even if, if you are an experienced speaker, if you have a like a 50 minute talk and you were recruited to give that exact same talk, but you had to do it in a lightning talk block. It really makes you refine the core points of your presentation and your delivery to compress it that much. Because yes, I've, I've seen people try to do this by just talking faster, like really, really fast, just try to get it in a short time block. But uh, but it, it can really refine your presentation if you can if you can get your delivery more succinct. One hundred percent agreed. So. Uh, going back to how the meetings typically flow, we have a two-hour block because we usually start at 6 p.m. The library kicks us out at 8. Um, and we chose the library because um, back in the day, we met at Synergy Mill. The the hosts at Synergy Mill in the building were were fantastic. However, the, the room that we were using was getting a little crowded. We were, we were regularly finding 10 to 15 attendees every month, month after month, and that room actually two different conference rooms that, that were accessible for us, uh, simply weren't, weren't working out. The library has multiple rooms, particularly um, the downtown library that can hold 300 people. And we often don't sell out 300, but, but we, we have plenty of room to fit our needs and to be able to break out and kind of spread out a little bit. Yeah, That's it's great to have a resource like that. Absolutely. And, and perhaps um, I should make a plug. We're always looking for other locations. The libraries are great. They have some limitations. Uh, though we haven't run into this limitation, since it's a public space, anyone can come into our meetings, whereas Synergy Mill was a little more closed off, you could say, more invite only, even though we would, of course, open the door for anyone who is going to show up for our meeting. The, the libraries, the public libraries are very specific about that. It has to be all inclusive. You can't turn anyone away. Nice. Which again hasn't been a problem for us, but we're always looking out for other venues, uh, more interesting places. I I wish we could mix it up a little bit and choose other places, perhaps uh, a spot that can allow us to stay past eight p.m. because the libraries close at eight and we have to pack it up and go. So how the meeting goes, we typically spend up to the first hour on the core talk and some of the introductory, and then we have breakouts. Uh, breakout sessions. You mentioned the luck pick, the red team village, and the blue team village. Uh, one you didn't mention, or maybe you mentioned earlier in this talk, is the career village as well. Those I was villages, planning on bringing that one up at the end. Perfect. So we'll come back to that. Uh, but these villages, as we call them, sometimes will run multiple simultaneously, and sometimes you'll just have a crowd of people standing around looking like they're doing nothing, just standing around talking, which which is okay for us sometimes because yeah. we already had the the... The, the talk, the more formalized presentation, and then we, we have something more informal, less structured at the later half. The lockpick village is just like it sounds. We bring in a pile of lockpicks, uh, a pile of padlocks and door locks and such, and let people play. If you've been to um, B-Sides Greenville, they often have a company called Foxpick that comes in that does this very thing. They just bring in tables of lockpicks and locks. They make it fun. They have contests and and interesting prizes where 
where it becomes more of a, a mental challenge and a physical challenge to open locks. And anyone can do this from, from kids to as old as you want to be to manipulate locks. Because if you look at a padlock or a door lock, it's simply a mechanical puzzle. It takes a key, which happens to fit in just a certain way to open that puzzle. What many folks don't um, believe or haven't witnessed themselves is that puzzle can be broken just like any other security control. There are ways to bypass it and break it and, and get through that in various ways, some of which are creative, some of which are more brute force, which we are not kicking down doors, but um, there are multi multiple ways to do this. And it's a safe environment because it's not illegal to pick your own locks, or it's not illegal to come in, join a uh, DEF CON meeting and pick locks there because it's not owned by anyone trying to protect anything. So it's a safe space to practice. Uh, should I go on to the red and blue team or do you have any questions? No, I, I, do, I do actually have some questions about the, the lock picking piece. So if, if I were to come out to one of these meetings and I've, I've never done any type of lock picking before, uh, is there somebody who can kind of show me how to get started with this or, you know, give me some idea of what I'm doing or and is there advice for, for how to train on, on any of this stuff? Cause I know I did go to B size this year and I've actually got this sitting on my desk. One of the companies like TCM security was actually handing out these little wallet size lock pick kits. Yes. which I thought was pretty cool. Mine's still in the wrapper, but, um, but it, it's interesting. I'm, you know, I'm curious to learn, like if I, if I were to want to learn how to do this, um, is, is DC-864 a good place to come get started and, and try it out and kind of get some advice on how to do it? And if I was getting into into penetration testing, how do you use uh, lock picking professionally? Okay. Our meetings are a great place to start and get some hands-on with lock picking. However, it's, it's um, so approachable that anyone can do it wherever you are. You can buy a lock pick set for as little as 10 or $20, maybe $30 or so from Amazon any day and have it shipped to your home. You, if you have a padlock, you can get started. There are many, many videos on YouTube that explain how, how a lock cylinder works and how the, the various parts of a lock works and how these, um, these mechanisms are bypassed or, or broken past using simple tools like a lock pick and a tension wrench. This is certainly accessible to anyone. If you're interested in lock picking, I would say look at YouTube first. There's okay. um, there's some popular YouTubers like the Lockpick Lawyer. He doesn't necessarily show the step by step on how to break locks. He's typically reviewing what's a good lock and what's a bad lock and how quickly he can pick stuff. Um, he's almost a genius a wizard at this. He can literally pick a padlock in a few seconds, whereas it might take me a couple of minutes to, to accomplish the same thing, or I may not even accomplish it in, in many cases. And he, he gets very entertaining and he talks about a lot of different esoteric types of locks. There are other uh, YouTube videos that explain in, in animated detail exactly how a lock pick works and how the, the keyway works and, and the pins and springs and so on. What we have at the um, the DEF CON meetings are several clear locks that are translucent. I've heard I may, of them. I may have one. Uh, actually, I don't have one within reach. I'd have to dig around for it. But essentially, you can see through it, inside it, and see exactly how it works. Now, I don't know if it was by design or what. I, I bought a pair of translucent locks from Foxpick at a conference in um, a B-Sides in Charleston, and they're very, very easy to pick. That, that is not a bad thing. That could help someone who is um, less aware of what lock picking is, or or maybe less confident about it, and get some hands on and easily open a lock and be be fairly comfortable with that type yeah. of lock, and then step up to something um, higher security. Typically, the higher security locks are going to cost more than ten dollars for a padlock. They're yeah. going to be fifty dollars upwards to two hundred or more. So, where do you use this professionally? Professionally, I don't use lock picking too often. When I'm doing uh, physical assessments, I will rarely try to pick a lock. The last time I did was a couple months ago, and I failed uh, simply because I'm not I'm not the best at lock picking. There are others who are really great at it. It's in my opinion, it's a fun hobby. I don't know how how actually useful and practical it may be in the real world. There are certainly um, 
certainly penetration testers who are better than me at picking locks that can absolutely prove it. What I find that's more useful rather than picking a lock is to bypass the latch in a physical assessment using mm -hmm. something called a traveler hook, which is a 90 degree small pick tool or even a thin card, like a hotel room card or or specially designed cards that are a little bit bigger, maybe the, the size of a, a small notebook that you can wiggle in between um, the door and frame and, and um, essentially shim the latch open. I, yeah. I found those those are other bypass techniques. Lock picking isn't the only way to get through a door that for me has worked better than actually picking lock. Okay. Well, so, you know, the, uh, the lock picking stuff is interesting. So if, uh, if there's anybody in, interested in getting into that out there, it's listening to uh, DC ethics floor and YouTube, definitely good places to start there. The, the translucent locks seem really like an interesting, a really interesting way to start things up. So we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to come back and talk about uh, red teams and blue teams. Be right back. Is your current hiring process like watching a hamster run on a broken wheel? Spinning fast, going nowhere, and frankly, a little embarrassing. Relax, weary hiring warriors. Enter STEM Search Group, your knights in shining algorithms. They specialize in finding top-tier talent, the kind who won't ghost you after the first interview. They actually screen candidates before sending their resumes understand skills, and won't waste your time just trying to check some kind of phantom quota box. Ditch the hamster wheel. Find your coding unicorn with STEM Search Group. Visit stemsearchgroup.com before your sanity does. Disclaimer, unicorns may not be included, but highly skilled engineers definitely are. All right, welcome back. We're still here with Luke. So uh, let's talk about red teams and blue teams. So what is a red team? What is a blue team? How do they work? What is the, the dynamic and how are the villages at DC 864? Um, how do those function? There's some interesting background that we should cover. Earlier in this conversation, we talked about penetration testing versus red teaming. Right. The, those definitions that I gave are, are by the book definitions. Unfortunately, our profession tends to muddy things up and make it even more complicated by calling one side of the profession a red team and the other side a blue team. These, these terminologies go back to the, um, the U.S. military. And the U.S. military labeled a defensive strategy, uh, defensive hardware, defensive people, defensive equipment, defensive weapons as blue team. Whereas the red team was either a, an attacking or a simulated attack performed by individuals, their tools or, or their equipment, their weapons, et cetera, as, as the attacker. So in, in our profession, we call blue team a defensive team. That's usually individuals working for a company or, uh, someone performing defensive strategies, uh, programming firewalls, setting up networks, uh, programming web application firewalls, uh, building the defenses to protect against the red team who are attacking those defenses and trying to find a way through. Does that, do you think that's pretty clear? Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense. So in the, um, in the DC 864 meetings, we have two, uh, two breakouts villages, the red team village and the blue team village. Normally we, when we run these villages, sometimes we'll do the lock pick and, and one of the others, we're not breaking out into all three or four of these villages. We often don't have enough attendees and it, it might break up the whole flow of the conversation. If we had four individual groups trying to talk over one another in the, in the one room that we're typically in, it would get very crowded and very noisy. So, so to be clear, when we break out into these, we're often only running one or two of those villages at a time. Uh, typically the red team village talks about the things that I'm doing, penetration testing or red teaming or attacks or vulnerabilities or bypasses. It, it does a little bit of overlap with, with lock picking because as, as I described what lock picking is, it is a bypass of a mechanical puzzle essentially. And that is exactly what a red teamer would do. Try to find a bypass into an electronic or digital system, into a virtual system, uh, through a person or, or, um, into a building. So all of that would be considered red teaming. Whereas the blue teaming is defensive. We have individuals that are talking about, um, 
firewalls, how to set them up, the best way to manage them, uh, log collection, and how to uh, minimize time looking at logs and make them most efficient and most effective for an organization or themselves. And a lot of these um, these setups for blue team or red team can be built in one's home in a home lab, and that's that's typically what we use to actually train and practice ourselves. We we often do have a home lab running virtual machines and such. We'll we'll fire off an attack against from one machine against another to practice those exploits, to practice defending against them so that we have a really deep understanding of what's happening behind the scenes so that when we're faced with that question from a customer, we can say, this is exactly how it goes down. And this is why you should protect your system from this event because X, Y, Z could happen. Interesting. Interesting. Could you have a preference on which side of this you like to be on the red team or the blue team? Since I'm a penetration tester, I'm naturally fitting into the, the red team realm. But I do want to be clear that the red team works for the blue team. It's not one versus another. Right. It's not one that, that's maliciously attacking another. In, in my humble opinion, I work for the blue team. I work for the defenders. My work and the reports that I generate and the information that I gather and, and the, the risks that I convey are essentially helping the blue team defend their systems better, defend their buildings better, defend their people in a better way. Without my insights, they are less likely to know these things because we make assumptions about the world. How many web applications have been built without being penetration tested and there's security vulnerabilities throughout. So essentially I'm helping the blue team by being a red teamer. Uh, there are certain sense. other individuals who feel that there's uh, a more broad richness to the blue team. There's there's certainly a lot more work to be done on the defensive side. For for red teamers, we're essentially the attackers. We're a minority of the the people that work in the field to to test security and to to assist the blue team. It, it's it's interesting hearing about a little bit of both because I know there's a lot of. A lot of surface area to protect. There's a lot of different attack vectors and whatnot. Um, I know we were talking about uh, about that the podcast Dark Knight Diaries a little bit earlier, and I think one of the more interesting episodes that I heard it, it wasn't particularly exciting. I just found it really fascinating. Was a guy talking about a story where he did literally everything that he could and could not get through, got caught. Um, he said it was the most frustrating experience of his life because the company had such good defenses. And I mean, they went as far as to place him as a new hire in marketing. So he was in the company every day for two weeks gathering information. Uh, he uh, he had like an entire uh, cracking setup uh, at his house where he was, you know, where he finally got some information and was trying to, to crack some passwords. But they were all uh, they were all so, uh, so highly encrypted that he only managed to get like one or two through. And then he finally managed to get somebody in the finance department to run uh, some code for him on their computer. And within five minutes had people from IT uh, coming over to talk to him. And they said that we, uh, you know, we have, um, we have some systems that monitor what typically runs on these machines. And this machine was running something that it never does. And they immediately stopped it, immediately flagged it down and started grilling him on who in the world he was and what he was doing there. And, uh, it was really impressive to see that level of, of defense where people are, are really looking at, you know, what are the typical behaviors of these machines or these accounts used for? And if they're doing something that they're not typically doing, um, it's cause for a red flag and everything that goes into that. I just, I thought the whole thing was fascinating. <laughs> so, I'm very much a, a, on the blue team side of things. I, I think just in terms of defenses for all this stuff all the time, that's why I got into the anti-fishing work in the first place. Like when it comes to video games, I love like tower defense type video games where I'm trying to build up the perfect defense to stop everything from getting through. And uh, it's just kind of how, how my brain works, I guess. But something, uh, something, if we can back up for a second about that episode you mentioned from Darknet Diaries, that was a pretty recent one. I think it was November or December where this person got a job at the, the employer to try to infiltrate them. their systems. I, I vaguely remember that one. At the end of the day, the, the client, the employer, the, the customer that we're working for, they win either way. Yeah. If if they catch us, they win because their security was good enough to notice the things that we were up to, the, the out of place 
attacks that we may have created or or um, the code that was maliciously run that's never been run before in the environment. If we are able to to break in, if we are able to run that code or plant malware as a simulation or, or get past a cer- uh, certain security control, the client still wins. They win because that's going to show up in our report and they're going to be able to fortify their defenses to uh, essentially mitigate those risks to the best of their ability so that the next time we come around, we're going to either have a greater challenge to get through or not get through at all. I can't think of another profession where we're telling our customers to make our lives harder. Yep. <laughs> that's a, that's a good place to be though. So, you know, the last yes. village that we didn't really talk about yet at, uh, at the um, DCA six four meetings is the career village. And so what type of stuff do y'all do in the career village? We talk about careers. Okay. So do you have any advice for somebody who's wanting to uh, kind of break into InfoSec? There's I so use much, those exact words because I found a post like that on your blog. There's so much that can be covered. And yes, our blog does does cover that. Uh, I mentioned to you before we started recording how I'm I'm coming up with, with a, an updated version of that getting into InfoSec blog because I'm answering this question often. Those of us who are in the field are also answering it often. One of the going back in my life to my whole purpose of being in information security is it's it's a very challenging yet rewarding career path for someone. And this is not a secret. A lot of people know that it pays really well. The unemployment is near zero for information security. There's a lot of work to do and, and a short time to get there. There's just so much going on. The, the problem that we're constantly running into is getting that initial foothold into an organization almost feels like a penetration test. That initial foothold is the hardest. Once you get past the 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 outer crusty shell of an organization in a pen test, the the um, the outer firewall or the outer perimeter defenses, usually what's inside is much softer because everything is trusted. It yeah. it very much looks just like that getting into a career path in InfoSec. And some of the things that we talk about in the DC group very often is helping others and helping others find an easier path in. Unfortunately, there's not one one great path in because everyone's story is different. Everyone's situation is unique and there's just so many ways of getting in. I think one of the mindsets of if someone is interested in offensive security or red teaming, uh, penetration testing or otherwise, one of the, the best ways of looking at it, or even someone who's not, someone who's simply interested in getting into the field in general, is to look at it from an attacker perspective, look at it as the as the old school terminology of what a hacker is. A hacker is not someone who's always malicious. The original term hacker came from the MIT group who, who basically used telecom switches and telecom equipment to run their model trains. And they... <laughs> They, and you can look nice. this up and, I didn't know and there's, there's a rich history in what a hacker is. And they essentially repurpose something that was used for something else to, to uh, essentially for their own means and their own needs. And it works out great. And that's what we yeah. do every day. We, we look at a problem, we look at a, a system and find another way of, of interacting with it or causing it to do something that was unrelated to what it was designed to do to somehow circumvent something. So that's, I think that's the, the best mindset to take in terms of getting a job in InfoSec to, to break it down, take it apart and figure out this is, this is the normal way of getting in. You get an education, you get some training, you talk to recruiters, you talk to hiring managers, you apply for jobs and hope you get something um, through an interview. That's, that's the typical course. Maybe there's another way. Another great path is to talk to people who already work for that company and start working on projects with them, work on capture the flag events, uh, running your own or meet up with others who are already in the field like we ve- like we do uh, every single month in the DEF CON group and in the ISSA group. We're networking with one another. We know who's who and who's capable of what and those who aren't capable of something quite yet. We can help them get up to speed and and point their efforts in the right direction so that they can educate themselves and learn. Because uh, as we mentioned earlier, this is a lifelong learning type of career where IT developing and and InfoSec are one and the same is 
you don't join this field so that you can clock out at 5 p.m. and and end your work and do something else. It's there's a lot more study, a lot more training and practice well beyond that. Yeah, beyond that time. And you got to learn to love it. Yeah, did I answer your question? Yeah, you did. Well and there? and so uh, I know we're we're getting close to time here, but I want to uh, segue into one last thing that you just talked about. You talked about capture the flag events, and so DC eight six four and you and, and the DC eight six four team ran a capture the flag event during the Carolina Code Conference this year. We gave out it ran alongside the conference for the participants all day. A lot for a lot of people, it was you know the first time they'd ever done something like this. Um, we're very committed to having a cybersecurity presence at uh, at the Carolina Code Conference going forward because you know, I'm I am personally a huge fan of of the idea of of what you talked about. Like you're as a red teamer, you're working for the blue team. You're helping everybody to get better. And I think more developers having better knowledge of cybersecurity and more cybersecurity people having more knowledge of, of the the programming and backend side, it's going to make everybody better in general. Um, and so we definitely want to have that. And I think you also ran a, a capture the flag event at B sides as well. So for everybody who's listening, what is a capture the flag event? A capture the flag or CTF is a simulated event that in in our case we call it a Jeopardy style uh, capture the flag. Essentially, you're presented with a web page that you connect to either over Wi-Fi or the public internet, and this this web page asks you to create a team name either for yourself or for a team because some capture the flag events run as teams as well. Uh, once you join that, create a team, you are presented with a question, sometimes an introductory question, sometimes you see all of the questions. And typically these questions are weighted, they're categorized into certain categories. I completely don't remember what kind of categories we had at um, the Carolina Code Convention or B-Sides, but they were general attack type simulations. They were general defensive questions. They were complete uh, oddball questions, completely off topic from cybersecurity. So we we wanted to combine everything into one to make this uh, more interesting and more approachable for anyone who who came in. For the code conference in particular, we wanted it to be more approachable for developers because we thought that that's going to be the the general consensus, the general type of attendee that would be at that um, conference. We modified it a bit for for B-sides to be a little more um, technical, more in-depth. But essentially, this is anything that someone can bring a laptop to a conference to, connect to it, start asking questions or start answering questions. Um, I remember one of the, the more interesting um, categories we had is called OSINT or open source intelligence. Essentially, you're presented with a question that you can answer by searching something, typically searching a search engine, sometimes a map type of um, uh, a mapping tool such as Google Maps or Google Earth to to pull uh, photos or a street view or something of a space and answer a question or, or use some kind of information that you have found on the internet at no cost to, to participate in that. Uh, that being one, one rough example of that. Um, and so the, the goal is just to, is basically to find the answers to these questions. Are they like getting into a server trying to exploit vulnerabilities or is that, how exactly does this work? Some capture the flags are like that. One one style of capture the flag, the opposite type of Jeopardy style is called King of the Hill style. King of the Hill style capture the flag is essentially a virtual network that's set up. It could be cloud hosted or it could be on premises hosted um, on one or multiple servers that's that's running in the space. Uh, essentially, they are running a network with vulnerable systems. And the attacker or the participant mm -hmm. would attack the vulnerable system if they can get into it and gain control of it, what we call root. Uh, if you're familiar with Linux, that should be yeah. pretty um, pretty straightforward. Uh, essentially, control root of the box, and then you have to switch roles and defend it from the other attackers. Mm -hmm. And the way those are scored is typically how long you hold control of a server. Uh, what's interesting about capture the flag events both Jeopardy and um, King of the Hill style, is that there's there's a little bit of trickery and a little bit of, um, uh, you could say, surreptitious activity. And what I mean by that is there are some teams that sit very idle. They might answer a question or two, 
on the scoreboard. And, and one, one of the things I didn't describe yet is the scoreboard. It's very interactive. You can see which team is in the lead and, and which teams are, are signed up to, to join. You can see how people's scores tend to rise throughout the day. You can see how some teams have a very constant score for the longest time. And then they hop up above all the other teams as if out of nowhere. What they did was they collected all the answers and held them as, as a uh, mental play on the other teams, yeah. uh, meaning, Hey, team A is doing great. They have this very steady increase. It looks like they're in the lead. Looks like we might have a winner throughout the day. And then team B comes out of nowhere, answers a lot of questions. And suddenly they rise to the top on the scoreboard, uh, seemingly out of nowhere. So, so it's kind of a, a fun interplay of, of those psychological challenges, you could say. Nice. That, that uh, interplay with uh, capture the flags. Well, I, I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot here or not, but I, I would uh, love to see y'all run another one of those events uh, this year. I don't know if that's in the in the cards for y'all or not, but uh, but I do hope that we get to to talk about having you back to do that again because it was a big hit. A lot of people were really interested in participating. We had a really good time, and I don't want to speak for the others, but we hope to do it again. The the surprise of running a capture the flag event, we learned a lot. We we certainly learned to. Um, to build out more beefy servers because the, <laughs> the ones that we had were, were quickly crushed by the onslaught of activity. Nice. Um, and, and most of, most of a Jeopardy style capture the flag isn't actively exploiting a server, but we had asked a question in a way of someone who needs to find some information on a web server. We can find information by crawling it and by attempting different directories or, or different documents by simply guessing or fuzzing those those URLs. Unfortunately, yeah. there was a lot of that activity that, that certainly takes a lot of CPU and it brought it down for others. The, uh, but the, the, the really... programmer mindset of, of how do I get to this answer probably went straight to that. Because I know there was Absolutely. there were some questions where people were coming up and asking me like my favorite number or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I planted that one, and that was one of the off-topic ones. And that my goal for that, I, I want to say it was my idea. My goal for that is to get some more interaction between people in yeah. the event. And I think I also asked other um, other speakers and, and some of the vendors for some answers to questions that we could develop so that that would help um, lubricate some of the conversation between attendees, speakers, and and vendors that were there. And nice. that's something I've never seen at a Capture the Flag event. Usually it's just straight up, uh, complete introverts head down in their laptop or, or if they bring a desktop computer, which I've never seen, but in head down in their computer working the whole day and not even looking up uh, wow. to, to interact with others. So I wanted to add that human touch to it. But yes, we want to come back to it. One of the surprises okay. were definitely the server outages that we experienced. But the other one that we didn't think about is the time it takes to put this together. Uh, it, it takes a couple of months to to develop and formulate those questions and, and make them flow, make them make sense, and then double check one another to make sure that we don't have a, um, a participant say, hey, this is impossible to answer. You, you guys are a bunch of idiots. There's no way to do this. And we can quickly say, well, it's been checked by two different individuals, not the person who wrote the question. And here's how you get to it. If if you want to see that, or we typically won't give them the answer during the event, but after the event, we'll, we'll happily walk someone, walk someone through it. But I hope we can, we can come back this year. Oh, it was a lot be of, a part we, of def it. we definitely hope to see that. Now we are, we are very much at time. I think we you might be in the running for, uh, for longest podcast we've had so far. So, uh, just want to encourage everybody to check out dc864.org. I'll have some links in the, uh, in the show notes for you. Um, and uh, we got to give my weekly shout out to to Herd Media. Thank y'all, Herd Media, for, uh, for helping me get this podcast put together. If you're looking to put together a podcast and you'd like it to be professionally produced, so that you don't even have to uh, do anything um, in terms of the editing and publishing of it, they'll they'll handle all that for you. Uh, they are available at uh, Trust Herd. You can find their their link in the show notes as well. Uh, thanks for coming on the show, Luke. And, it's great. Uh, and this has been the Carolina Codecast.